Um, but just to sort of set a little bit of context uh, in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, with hate crime rising in the current political climate, both Jews and Muslims are suffering. So there's a shared agenda here. And what we wanted to do today is look at some of the trends that are affecting both of us um, and look at some of the uncomfortable realities uh, within and between our communities. And then we're going to talk a bit about some of the ideas that we have for change and the way in which Nisan Nashim, which actually means women in Arabic and Hebrew, um, deliberately chosen for its similarities, um, and talk about some of the ways in which we're working to um, develop a shared agenda for change. Thank you, Laura, and um, hello, everybody. As Laura said, my name is Akila Ahmed, and as well as being a trustee for Nisa Nashim, which I'm very proud of, um, I also sit on the government's working group on anti-Muslim hatred. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, anti-Muslim hatred in wider society and some of the um, drivers around it. Um, and then I'll also touch on some of the kind of thornier issues within um, Muslim communities as well. Um, so if we look at anti-Muslim hatred in society, well, you probably all know the names of Muhammad Salim, Makram Ali, Mohsin Ahmed. They were all murdered, um, and their murders were driven by anti-Muslim hatred. Um, and Makram Ali was killed in the Finsbury Park attack outside Muslim Welfare House last year. Um, so the consequences of anti-Muslim hatred are fatal. Um, and we've not only seen sort of fatal um, killings like this in the last few years, but we've also seen a general increase in anti-Muslim hatred against Muslim individuals, symbols of faith, um, quite horrendous attacks against individuals like Nasser Kurdi. He was stabbed outside a mosque. So mosques seem to be a key feature around anti-Muslim hatred. Um, I'm going to just briefly run down through a few statistics that Tell Mama have gained over the last few years, and you can actually probably go to their website and, and look at these statistics in more depth. But just a kind of you know few headlines. In 2016, Tell Mama recorded 642 verified anti-Muslim hate crimes. Um, these were all offline. They were meaning that they happened on the street between individuals. Um, and this is a 47% increase since 2015. And I know from my own research that in 2015, there was a similar increase from 2014. So year on year, we're seeing roughly just under 50% an increase in anti-Muslim attacks. Um, and a lot of these attacks are happening in public areas, public transport, um, anti-Muslim attacks are gendered. They're more likely to be perpetrated by a white man against a Muslim woman, a Muslim woman who is visibly Muslim, so somebody like me who wears hijab or who wears niqab. I personally find that I often get shouted at or something like that when I'm with my children, so when I'm even more vulnerable. Um, so anti-Muslim attacks are rising, and it's, it's, it's awful, it's horrendous, and we need to do something about it. And as Laura said, we're also going, and Laura was touched on anti-Semitism, but we're also seeing similar um, sort of thing around um, anti-Semitism. Now, but if we look at anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hatred, we can see clear parallels. In 2011, academics did a research in Germany, did research in Germany, and they found, and I quote them, frighteningly clear parallels between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, such as collective constructions, dehumanization, misinterpretation of religious slash political imperatives, and these are then used by, um, as sources, and conspiracy theories. Um, so these are all patterns and tropes that are found in both anti-Semitic and Islamophobic discourses. So now this is separate to hate crime. This is looking more broadly at um, the bigotry against Muslims and Jews and the discourses around it. There's some um, mood music, if you like, that contribute towards you know, actual attacks and hate crime. So unfortunately, um, these anti-Semitic and Islamophobic discourses not only exist within wider communities, but they also exist within our own communities, within, within our own respective faith groups. And I'm sure many of the Muslims sitting in the audience today would have heard from your fellow Muslims um, some, some of the tropes around Jewish people. You know, their Jews dominate the media, or you would have heard sometimes um, 
People use the term Zionism as a euphemism for anti-Semitism. So these are very real problems that not only exist within wider society, but they also exist within our own faith groups. Um, and the question is, what are we going to do about it? Because we can talk about it, but actually and recognize the problem and acknowledge it, which is important. But what are we going to do about it? So we'll talk a bit more about what we're going to do about it in a moment. But just to say that the, this sort of bigotry and hatred that we see within our own faith communities, it's compounded by the political situation in the Middle East and the Palestine-Israel conflict. Now, the Palestine-Israel conflict is going to be an intractable issue at some level, and it is going to be a driver for both anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hatred. We can't deny that. Um, however, you know, I think to myself, as a British Muslim sitting here in the UK, what can I do about that conflict? There's nothing that I can do about that conflict. Um, so I'm not going to focus on that. When I work with my um, Jewish brothers and sisters, I'm not going to focus on that either. What I am going to focus on is on what we can do to address the increasing challenges that both our communities and faith groups in the UK and beyond are facing, which is this increasing bigotry and hatred within and externally to our communities. So in the UK and beyond, there's a growing popularity of far-right ideologies and a growing sympath sympathy towards them as well. Now, the hatred of far-right movements towards Muslims and Jews is and should be of growing concern to both our faith groups. If we look at the way it manifests, um, for example, two years ago, there was an attack against a mosque in Liverpool. Now, this attack uh, was basically, graffiti was put on the wall of the mosque, and the letters EDL were written on there, and then there was also a swastika. So this example highlights how individuals with far-right sympathies um, but who are also hateful, that's sort of driven by their hatred against Muslims, are taking kind of traditional anti-Muslim symbols or groups like the EDL, and they're marrying it with Nazi symbols. Um, so there's, there's, there's a sort of a link between the two there. Um, and so what was traditionally used against Jewish people is now also being used against Muslim people. So there's clear parallels. And I think it's also important to note that groups like the EDL or politicians like Geert Wilders in the Netherlands or Marine Le Pen in France, they will say they are friends of Israel. They will say they're Zionist, um, but actually, and that they're only anti-Islam and counter-jihadi, but actually they are anti-Semitic. Because then if you look at their policies and the things they advocate for, they will advocate for things like um, banning of ritual slaughter, the banning of circumcision, which we've seen recently in Iceland. And these types of policies will affect Muslims and Jews. And they will not only increase hatred towards them, but they will effectively criminalize Muslims and Jews in those countries if they came into an effect. So the shared agenda of working together to counter and address the, f the threat from the far right in the UK, Europe, USA, and beyond is something that both faith groups need to not only consider but actively and proactively work on and tackle together. I'll hand over to Laura now. Thank you. So thank you, Akila. Um, who, Akila's focused on um, anti-Muslim hatred in Britain. Um, and as she said, there are parallels with uh, anti-Muslim, um, with anti-Semitism in Britain and the growth of anti-Semitism. So just to give, you can't directly compare the figures that come from Tell Mama and from the CST because they're done differently. But what you can look at is the growth in both. And uh, what we found is that um, the CST reported nearly 1,400 hate crimes um, against Jews in 2017, which was the highest ever. And um, a lot of this is, um, is verbal abuse, but they also reported a 34% rise in violent assault against Jewish people in Britain. So uh, even if you can sort of turn a blind eye to some of the uh, less physical attacks, the physical attacks are on the rise as well. Um, as Akila said, Muslim women are particularly vulnerable. Um, the evidence that we need to explore more, but the evidence seems to be that Jewish men are more vulnerable, but I, 
our suspicion is this because Muslim women look very different and Jewish men look different. So they're the people who would stand out on the street and be the ones who are likely to be um, affected. So the gender issue doesn't work the same ways. But these are the highest figures ever recorded in Britain uh, since the CST started doing it. Um, and what I don't want to focus on about what the Jewish community feels very much is that we have a shared agenda absolutely in the anti-Semitism growth on the right, uh, from the right, if you like, um, which is an international movement. Uh, the Jews are also experiencing anti-Semitism on the far left and a fear about anti-Semitism in the Muslim community in Britain. So these are more difficult things to explain and more difficult things to talk about, um, but from a Jewish perspective, they're very much an issue. Um, as Akila said, this, the, the anti-Semitic or anti-Muslim hatred expresses itself in all sorts of different ways. And one of the things that's very difficult from a Jewish perspective is that some of it's very sort of what we might call good old-fashioned anti-Semitism. It's things about money and power and influence, and that's traditional anti-Semitic tropes. The more recent ones that are more difficult are twofold. One of them is conflating anti-Semitism with anti Israel feelings, and where you see it very easily, uh, but it's difficult to pin it down, is where the word Jew is taken out and the word Zionist is put in. So all this traditional Jewish tropes, but instead of saying you nasty, nasty Jews, you say you nasty Zios. Uh, but you could take the word out and substitute it very hard to define it as anti-Semitism, but Jews feel it very much. Um, and the other one that is really problematic is the use of the Holocaust. So not only Holocaust denial or chipping away at the uh, evidence behind Holocaust as a, existing and its numbers and did it really happen and did the Jews in Germany um, uh, work with the Nazis? Were they really part of it? Were they complicit? That, that's sort of chipping away. But even worse is where you start to use Holocaust terminology to attack the Jews, which in a way is the most vicious type of Holocaust. So talking about, for example, uh, the Holocaust in Gaza. So you use the most vicious, the most uh, emotional type of attack or uh, wording against Jews, and you use it against the Jews. So there's very much a, a reframing of Holocaust terminology against the Jews. So there's different types of anti-Semitism going on, all out there, all in the mix, all problematic. And another one which Akila referred to is people like the EDL, you know, going on marches and having a few Israeli flags in their midst, uh, which is terrible from a Jewish perspective because they do it deliberately to imply that the Jews are part of that movement. Um, they will find one or two rogue Jews to put in there and, uh, and say, yes, look, the Jews are on our side too, which is terribly damaging because, of course, A, it isn't true, and B, it's, it sets up all of the wrong uh, narrative in there and sets people against each other who are not really against each other. So uh, there is a, um, a shared agenda here in terms of people being targeted, but it's different and it's subtly different and it's important that people get their brains around or we try and get our brains around what those differences are. Um, Akila talked about some of the shared issues from the far right, um, particularly European far right, but then there's two other big issues that we're facing today. One is, of course, the Trump agenda and the Trump um, administration. And the second one is Brexit, and how Brexit seems to be allowing the worst types of narrative to be out on the streets and, uh, and seem to be uh, normalized. And part of the whole Brexit agenda is the dislike of foreigners and people who are different. And both Jews and Muslims fall into that nicely um, as foreigners and people who are different. And therefore, the political climate that we're in uh, is something that we can unite again, um, around and feel very much um, in common with each other. There's another factor, which is the way in which we live, particularly as Jews. So there's just under 300,000 Jews in Britain and about 3 million Muslims in Britain, more or less. And the Jews live in very, very small geographical areas. About 60% of the Jewish population live in five London boroughs. 
So we are tiny community and living in our own little bubble. And most of the Jewish children, about 60% of Jewish children are in Jewish schools. And as a result, you know, and people have got different views about Jewish schools, or faith schools all, all together. But the point is, that I want to make, is that what it means is that not only do Jewish children and parents not meet other children and parents, but it also means that those parents don't meet Jews. So it works both ways in that we have a, a society where people are living in their own tight little worlds, and if you don't meet each other and you don't have a face to put to something, uh, it's really easy to dislike and mistrust and fear and victim and and um, uh, demonize. Um, I just also want to say something about um, the feelings that Jews have about Muslims, which is also quite tricky. So it's documented. You know, you can argue with the documentation, but there are research studies that have looked at how Muslims feel about Jews. There's nothing really that looks about how Jews feel about Muslims. However, I can air a little bit of dirty laundry here and point to the incident that happened recently in Golders Green, where a new Islamic center was being set up, and there was an outcry from the Jewish community about this. Now, how much this was the Jewish community and how much it was the local community, we can argue about, because the Jews are the local community in Gold is Green. But what was so uh, interesting about it, or depressing about it, however you want to look at it, was that there was so much fear and mistrust and anxiety within the Jewish community about having a mosque landing in the middle of Golders Green, an Islamic center with a mosque in it, you can define it how you want. Um, but also, I think on a more positive note, what was very positive was the Jewish establishment's reaction to this. So the Board of Deputies, the Jewish Leadership Council, all of the mainstream Jewish institutions came out very firmly against the Jewish community saying, this is not okay. We cannot have this sort of language being used about other people, about the Muslims, about the Muslims who are in our midst. So the, the downside of it was the demonstration of the fear and the anxiety that the Jews had. And the upside was the Jewish uh, immediate, that both Jewish newspapers came out immediately and said, this is not okay. So what we want to do now is talk a little bit about what we're doing um, and about Nisan Hashim. And it divides really, our work divides into two areas. One of them is the work we're doing locally that I'll come on to talk about. But the other is work that we're trying to do centrally uh, at a policy level. Thank you. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our sort of national kind of work at, at a policy level. So um, we meet regularly with, uh, if you like, um, MHCLG, which is which was D DCLG, central government, was the Department for Communities and Local Government. We've met with the London Mayor's Office and we've met with the Met Police, the lead for hate crime. Um, and the reason why we meet um, these bodies is because, first of all, we take the kind of the rich information that we get from our local groups about issues that are impacting Muslim women and Jewish women at a local level. But it's also we find um, that these themes are probably affecting sort of Jewish women and, and Muslim women and all women actually, um, and then we take and we put those forward to you know those bodies, uh, policymakers on specific issues so, so that they have a better understanding. Now, what we find through this sort of engagement is that actually, although one would feel that they would have quite a good understanding of the experiences of Muslim women and Jewish women. Um, unfortunately, they don't. So we met um, with the with the lead for hate crime at the Met Police um, a few months ago, and he sort of rather shockingly told us that he'd never been to a faith institution, a mosque, or a synagogue, and met women there. And we were astounded because it was 2017, and that really should not be on. It should not be to tolerated in 2017, especially when you've you know, we've had nearly, what, well, 100 years of centenary action, you know, 100 years that women have been able to vote. It's not acceptable that, well, some women, yes. Um, and it's not acceptable that, you know, there are certain groups of women that are being left behind and that their experiences, their voices are not being heard. So that was one example. We then had another meeting um, with somebody at the police and we were talking about having a round table between the police and Jewish women and Muslim women. And I think it's safe to say that 
at that meeting, it was clear that this person didn't have any understanding again of, although they'd met women, thankfully, and they'd done a lot of work with women, but they didn't have any kind of understanding of um, Muslim women and Jewish women. And they were just kind of talking about issues which really didn't relate to our members at all and didn't relate to their concerns. So, you know, hate crime just wasn't on their radar. Um, they were talking more about sort of knife crime and drugs, which are issues that obviously affect certain women from both our communities, but they're not the kind of the key issue that we're hearing from our groups. Um, and we were, again, shocked that, you know, given Brexit happened, given the knowledge around the increase in hate crime across all of society, and that Muslims are at the kind of forefront of that, or the, 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 the end of it, if you like, and, uh, and that, you know, the increase in anti-Semitism and all of that, we were just shocked that somebody in the police wasn't aware of it. Um, and then often we will hear that, you know, when we speak to policymakers that women need empowering and yada, yada, yada. And we're just sort of like, well, you haven't met our members, have you? <laughs> Come and meet our members who are strong, opinionated, um, who are not scared to speak. And then you will, you know, reassess your sort of um, desire to just focus on women needing to learn English and need empowering. So that's, that's, that's just to give you a flavor of some of the kind of the kind of national advocacy policy work that we're doing. We've got kind of mountains to kind of climb still, unfortunately. We've had simi similar experiences with the mayor's office in a different way, but they've been very good, and we were able to hold a round table, about 50 people with them, uh, directly with the lead of the head of police there, um, and we had a much better response. But again, a, a, a lack of understanding. Um, so we've got our conference coming up in April and our conference is focused on change makers and this is focusing on change makers, female change makers from within Muslim and Jewish communities and it's just been a joy actually just to see the breadth and width of talent there is, you know, that is within both our communities. Um, so I've just seen the time so I'm just going to kind of wrap up and, and hand over to Laura to talk more about the work that we do at local level. Thank you. So um, we believe that in order to really affect change, we have to be working both at a policy level and also at a grassroots level. Uh, there's lots of organizations that operate at policy level but don't really understand what's going on on the ground, and there's lots of organizations that operate on the ground and have no understanding at all about how to affect policy. And uh, what we feel very strongly at Nissan Hashim is that you have to do both. And we're lucky in that we, lucky, we've planned it, um, but we're lucky in that we've got uh, women involved who are able to mobilize both at uh, both levels. So at the grassroots level, we've set up groups around the country and we've got 29 groups, we've got how we, 30, um, but we've got 29 groups around the country and each one is co-chaired by a Jew and a Muslim. And what's been so interesting is that for 90% of our groups, we've had to introduce that Jew and that Muslim to each other. So typically a Jew will come forward to me or a Muslim will come forward to Julie or to Akila and say, we want to set up a group. And we say, well, do you bring along your Jewish friend to do it with you? And they haven't got one. And that is shocking because the women we're dealing with are articulate, educated, relatively powerful, connected women, and they don't have a Jewish or Muslim friend to do it with. So we then make an introduction and they bring along their friends and they set up these groups. And the groups are very important because they don't know each other. You know, people say, people I think have no realization, no understanding of quite how polarized or separate these two communities are. It is extraordinary. And we ha set up a program of all sorts of ways that people can get to know each other. So, for example, um, this month, March, we're going to be doing a, a project which will be all about Sadaka Day, which is a Muslim-led day of social action. In April, we will be doing a project about Passover. Um, and then in, when we get to Ramadan, we'll do a, bit of a project about doing iftars together. So our projects are all about demonstrating, showing each other about each other, offering people an opportunity to understand the other faith group in a very easy sort of a way. But what's so interesting is that even within this easy sort of a way, we immediately encounter challenges. So a very quick example um, would be, we had a, a group set up in Golders Green. We didn't have a Golders Green group, so we set one up. And the women got together and um, in a kosher cafe. In a kosher cafe. And the Jewish Muslim and the Muslim women, they didn't know each other. They got together. One of the Muslim women brought along some lovely pastries. 
And these pastries have been specially made and they were a special gift and she wanted to share these special gifts of these pastries. And of course, this was a kosher cafe with women who were quite orthodox women and the orthodox women wouldn't eat the pastries and didn't know what these women are doing, bringing unkosher pastries to a kosher cafe. Immediate possibility, immediate opportunity for conflict. Um, dare I say that maybe some, some groups of people who maybe weren't always women, might have found conflict in that, or found frisson in it, or found offense in it. But these women who had decided and made the decision that they were gonna get on, talked about it. Yeah, did you realize you can't actually bring those in here because it's a kosher cafe, and that means you can't bring things in. Oh, but these are very special ones that I bring, and I might be, feel offended if you don't eat my special. And they were able to have this conversation, which a lot of uh, scenarios would have led to a conflict or at least a misunderstanding and because everybody put their mind to getting on we didn't and the same happens when Israel Palestine comes up so in response to your first question is going to be what do we do about Israel Palestine what we have made the decision to do at this stage is to name it and park it Yes, we know this is a huge issue. Yes, we know it affects everything that goes on in terms of Jewish-Muslim relationships. Name it, park it. We're not ready to talk about it yet. Having said that, at our conference, we have made the decision to have the um, bereaved, uh, bereaved Family Forum, who are a group in Israel, Palestine, who have lost personal close family members to the conflict and come together to talk about it, they're coming over to talk to us because, and it was very relevant to the session I was just at, which um, Ruth and Jonathan ran, that if people could even begin to understand the other side has pain, we would make some progress. Because at the moment, we're not even at that stage. So we're going to bring them over and talk about the other side has pain, and at least we'll start to have that conversation. So um, we have these events. The other thing about the last thing I want to say about the local groups is, it's not enough for us to be engaging Jewish and Muslim women in this. And it's clearly not enough for us just to be engaging uh, articulate, educated Jewish and Muslim women in this. So we have to do much more. And the way we're doing that at this stage is, first of all, through things like social action, where people are seen together out on the streets doing things for wider society, but also by talking about it. So engaging with the local press, engaging with local organizations so that people can see not only do Jews and Muslims not hate each other, um, not only do we have a lot in common, but also we're both part of wider society, we're both contributing to wider society, we're, neither of us got horns, um, and actually we're both part of, of, of the wider piece. So by doing it together in local areas, we're really hoping that people will start to understand that. Thank <laughs> you.